In the last video, I told you that anaphylactic shock was a rapid onset, potentially fatal allergic reaction. In this video, we're going to discuss the mechanisms or the pathophysiology by which anaphylactic shock occurs. The triggers for anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock include foods, which depends a little bit on the culture you're in. In many countries, peanuts, other tree nuts, real uh, true nuts, like almonds, walnuts, uh, hazelnuts, seafood, uh, such as shrimp, lobster, clam, fish, like salmon, uh, wheat, soy, milk, and eggs are common, but in some cultures where they eat bird nest soup or a lot of sesame products, those can also be causes. In fact, almost any food can potentially cause a, a, a severe allergic reaction le leading to anaphylactic shock. And this is why especially peanuts, I'm dating myself a little bit here, but if you're as old as I am, you remember a time when on airplanes, you would, as a snack, get a little pack of peanuts. And those days are gone. And in school, in elementary school, there were no restrictions whatsoever on what we could bring for lunch. But you can't bring peanuts or peanut products into many of of those public places like schools because of the risk of anaphylactic shock. Medications are a second huge group, and this includes antibiotics, antibiotics. Um, most notably, uh, those include penicillin. I'll just abbreviate that PCN. But there's also uh, an important one called vancomycin, vancomycin. Again, almost any antibiotic can do it. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. And those include things uh, like aspirin, ASA, uh, ibuprofen. These are things commonly taken for pain, fever, inflammation. And then I listed other agents here, and those include things like what are called what's called radio contrast material. So, for example, if someone needs a CAT scan, uh, say of the chest or the brain or the abdomen, uh, they will get an intravenous injection of a material that, on the CAT scan, will show up as opaque, so it's easier to see certain structures. Then, what about insect venoms? Well, these are the stings, uh, the venoms in the stings of honeybees honeybees, bees, and other stinging insects, whoop, bees, um, yellow jackets, hornets. And uh, in certain climates, uh, fire ants, fire ants. Then sometimes, amazingly, there are physical triggers. And these include things like exercise, Exercise, heat, like a hot shower, cold. This can be particularly dangerous if you go swimming in cool water. That can cause anaphylactic shock. Even stress, which sounds awful. Uh, sunlight of certain wavelengths can cause this. And last but not least, there are kind of other triggers, which include latex, for example. Sometimes we don't know the cause, and we call anaphylactic shock idiopathic. Now, how does this actually work? What's going on in the body that results in anaphylactic shock? Well, we said in the last video that some of the major uh, signs and symptoms were in the skin, the lungs, and the gut. The lungs and the, and the gut. Okay, so if you look at the structure of the skin, we'll take that as our first example. You see there's this outer layer. Here's the above here is the outside world. And then this is kind of deep in the skin. If you kind of took a knife and cut open my skin and look at the layers, you see this upper layer here is called the epidermis. Epidermis. Dermis. And then there's this lower layer beneath this wavy line which is a much thicker, deeper layer called the dermis. 
And there are a number of important structures in the dermis that include blood vessels. This is a blood vessel. There are peripheral nerves. Here's a nerve ending. Nerve. And then, most important for our purposes, there is this cell, which I've drawn kind of in red, that is oftentimes crammed in between the wall of the blood vessel and the peripheral nerves. And this cell is critical for anaphylactic shock, and it is called the mast cell. It's one of the many cells of the immune system. And the mast cell is most notable for the presence of these purple dots inside. And it, there are so many of these little dots that it looks like just a big bag of purple. So what's happening in anaphylaxis is that one of these substances, let's say a food protein, gets into the body, and here's a little blue food protein, let's say a little food, and this food protein triggers the mast cell to release a ton of chemicals. Now the mast cell can make many, many different types of chemicals. Some of them are actually stored inside those little purple dots. That's what those purple dots are. They're actually little packets of chemicals. Now the most notorious of those chemicals is histamine. Histamine. And histamine is stored in the granules, in those little purple sacs, and it is fantastic at causing itching. In addition, although it takes a little bit more time, histamine comes out very rapidly from the cell because it's already there in the granule. Just like the tryptase, which we mentioned in the last video, that can be used as part of the diagnosis of anaphylactic shock. If there is a lot of tryptase found in the blood, that comes out of mast cells. But in a little bit of a delayed manner, the mast cell can produce other chemicals called leukotrienes. So for example, leukotriene C4, and prostaglandins, prostaglandin D2 is produced. These are all chemicals that are released by the mast cell. And then in a delayed fashion, the mast cell can even release other chemicals such as interleukin-4. But That can take hours, whereas the production of histamine can occur within, say, two minutes, and the production of leukotrienes and prostaglandins can occur within 15 to 20 minutes. These chemicals, histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, are fantastic at causing the blood vessel cells here to retract, and there is a loss of fluid from the blood compartment into the tissues. Histamine is great at causing a signal to go up the nerve, which our brain interprets as itching, and leukotrienes can do some of that as well. And in addition, leukotrienes and histamine can cause blood vessels to go from their kind of contracted state to a big open version like this. This is a small blood vessel here, and I, I've drawn it kind of opening up in a manner similar to how when you take your thumb off the garden hose, the water flows out of it much more slowly and sluggishly. So the combination of all of these effects, the loss of fluid, the opening up of blood vessels near the border between the dermis and the epidermis, and the uh, signaling of nerve cells, that combines to cause the skin to get very kind of swollen as fluid accumulates in here, very red because there's a lot more blood sluggishly flowing through the skin, and very itchy. And that is hives. Here's a picture of hives right here. And you can see that these areas of redness, there's a little bit of elevation. It might be a bit difficult to see that. And the center is a little bit clear. These are classic hives. And patients will report that they broke out in redness, itching, and the observer can find hives, or is it sometimes called urticaria, on the physical exam. That's all the result of mast cell activation. Well, a very similar set of events is occurring in the lungs. Here's the, where the air is in the lungs. This is the inside of a kind of tube in the lungs. I've, ha I've only drawn part of it, but you can imagine this is a whole tube. And there are some lining cells. And then these brown cells here are smooth muscle cells. And here's another blood vessel. Here's a blood vessel. Here's a mast cell with its purple granules. I'll just abbreviate this mast cell. When something is breathed in, let's say, uh, an allergen is breathed in and it contacts and turns on the mast cell, well, that's going to 
again, cause the release of all these chemicals. And these chemicals can cause fluid to leak out of the blood vessel, causing the airway to swell. Now it's got less of a cross-sectional area. And it can also cause the muscles here to kind of spasm. So they contract. And that causes the airway also to kind of crunch up. So instead of it being nice and open, it's harder to move air through there. And the airflow can become turbulent, producing wheezing. And many of the chemicals like leukotrienes can cause cough or the excess secretion of mucus. So there's a lot of mucus here in yellow. And that can actually plug up large parts of the airway. And that essentially causes, just as in the skin it caused hives, this causes asthma. And you might say, well, how can I tell if someone just breaks out in hives? Maybe they have an uh, anaphylactic shock. Well, or if this happens in the lungs, maybe this is just an isolated asthma attack. The critical thing is that if this occurs in multiple organ systems, in the skin, in the lungs, and in the gut, where here mast cell activation would also cause fluid to come out and muscle spasms, causing cramping, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. All of those things together, along with enough effect on the blood vessels to cause low blood pressure, that would constitute anaphylactic shock. But if it's just happening in the lungs, and there's some what we call bronchospasm, wheezing, cough, shortness of breath, chest tightness, that's just asthma. If it occurs in the skin alone, isolated, that's just hives. But if all of these things occur in all of the blood vessels in the gut, in the lungs, and in the skin all dilate, then that produces pooling of blood, and that results in low blood pressure anaphylactic shock.